This is Biology 1, Chapter 7, Cellular Structure and Function. Uh, in Part 1 of this video screencast lecture, uh, we will be talking about the cell theory as well as some tools of the trade of biologists, the microscope. And we will take a look at uh, the components of the plasma membrane or the outside of the cell. If it uh, was not for the invention of the microscope, we would not be able to see things that are smaller than what the naked eye can observe. Uh, Robert Hooke was uh, an Englishman. He, by trade, uh, made glasses for a living. He was a lens grinder. He was really the first person to use uh, the beginning rudimentary microscopes to describe and actually coin the term cell. So what he did with one of the early microscopes was he looked at a thin slice of cork. Now remember, cork is a part of the tree. It is a dead part of the tree. It's in kind of an insulative layer. Uh, so when Hook looked in the microscope, he saw what you see there on the right, which is our kind of wavy, empty looking little boxes. And it reminded him of the cells in the monastery where monks lived. Uh, they lived a very sparse life. Uh, in the um, mid-1600s, and so that kind of reminded him of, of a cell, so that's why he called them those. Now remember, the cell is the basic unit of life, and you've got to have at least one in order to be living. So we fast, uh, fast forward um, a, a few years uh, to the late 1600s. Uh, a guy by the name of Anton van Leeuwenhoek, uh, he was a Dutch guy, uh, he was also a professional lens maker, uh, he made and kind of modified the first decent microscope that was available uh, that you see there on the left side. Uh, it was very small. It was handheld. Uh, you would kind of hold it like a, like a ping pong paddle and put the uh, specimen there on the end of the pin and then look through the other side. Now, this wasn't anything more than a glorified magnifying glass, really. Um, but Van Leeuwenhoek observed some pond water. And he saw all of a sudden this new world open up, all these little things floating around in the water. Um, he called them animalcules uh, because the word molecule uh, was in the science vocabulary at this time. Uh, and he kind of melded it with, uh, with little animals. Um, they, of course, were small uh, multicellular or single-celled protists. Uh, but again, when you haven't ever seen anything before, you describe it the best way you can. So we're going to fast forward a little bit more on our uh, cell discovery timeline uh, to the cell theory. Uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Schleiden, he was a botanist, so he studied plants, uh, and using a better version of the microscope than both Van Leeuwenhoek and Hook used, uh, made the conclusion that plants are indeed made out of cells. Schwann was another gentleman that contributed to the cell theory. Uh, he was an anatomist, so he worked with animals. Uh, and using the microscope, he concluded that all animals are made of cells. Then we're going to fast forward a few more years to the mid-1850s. Uh, a guy by the name of Virchow proposed the idea that cells must come from other cells. Now, he wasn't sure of that process, but these cells had to come from somewhere. And all living things seemed to have them, uh, and they had to multiply in some way. So he just proposed the idea of cell division. He did not describe it. So these three gentlemen make up the uh, and contributed to the cell theory, which is one of the fundamental ideas of uh, modern biology. If you think of biology as a, as a building with a foundation and four corners, uh, really the cell theory is one of those corners of the foundation, as well as the theory of evolution, the germline theory of disease, and Mendel's laws of genetics. Really, for general biology, those are kind of the, the main, uh, main parts of modern biology. So what is the cell theory? These gentlemen came up with the conclusion that all organisms, plant or animal, uh, or protist, uh, or fungus, what have, or plants 
are made of and composed of at least one or more cells. And that those cells are the most simple life can be. And that somehow those cells come from other cells and they pass on genetic material. So we have the microscope of being the tool of the trade for biologists. Uh, as improvements were made to the quality of the glass, um, to the magnification power, we discovered more and more about cells. We could see further into uh, and discover more things about cells. Some common types of microscopes, uh, the ones that we will be using in class uh, in the lab, are called a compound light microscope. The reason why they call it compound is because it has two or more lenses associated with it. Most compound microscopes will magnify something up to a thousand times. Um, remember, there is a difference between magnification, which is making something larger, and resolution, which is making something more detailed and more clear. You need to have both in order to make a good observation of anything that is microscopic. You can't have a magnified fuzzy blob. It's not gonna tell you much about what that is. So you need magnification and resolution. Uh, the electron microscope. These are uh, the fancy schmancy uh, microscopes that are in uh, many research labs in colleges and universities as well as uh, hospitals. Uh, these use magnets instead of light to focus electrons on a sample. And what an electron microscope does is it gives a much, much larger magnification, but it also gives a very, very high detailed resolution picture. Different types of electron microscopes. The transmission electron microscope, or TEM, uh, gives an internal image of an organism. Uh, the picture that you see here is actually inside and near the nuclear envelope. So it's not of a cell, it's actually a picture of the inside of a cell. The scanning electron microscope, or SEM, uh, gives an external image, or a scan, outward scan, of an organism. Uh, this little guy here, believe it or not, uh, lives, one of these guys live in the roots of every single one of your eyelashes. Um, they are a helpful organism uh, that helps keep the gunk and the, and the junk out of your eyes. Um, but this is a, a very detailed picture with a very high, high magnification. An STM, a scanning tunneling microscope. This one can actually use living organisms uh, as well as inorganic ones as well. Um, in the diagram on the left there, you can see atoms of niobium and selenium in a crystal. So this is literally getting down to the atomic level, not just a microscopic level. An atomic force microscope uh, measures forces in objects. Um, it acts like a, a needle on a record uh, and scans the outside to give a, a very detailed resolution of that. All cells, no matter what kind of cell they are or what kind of living thing they're in, have these three things in common. First of all, they all have genetic material. They will have the nucleic acids, DNA, and RNA. Also, because cells are living things and all cells require energy to do life stuff, all cells will metabolize food and energy to do that life stuff. All cells also have a boundary that keeps things and controls what goes in and out. And we call that the plasma membrane. There's two basic types of cells. Uh, any cell anywhere can be busted up into these two categories. Prokaryotic. Pro means before or beginning. And karyo refers to the Latin word carrion, which means seed. Uh, in this case, the seed of the cell being the nucleus. So prokaryotic cells come before the nucleus. There's no specialized structures. Um, most bacteria are prokaryotic as well as uh, unicellular organisms. Eukaryotic cells, these are cells that are in more complex life, uh, like you and I. These do contain a nucleus and organelles, which literally translates into little organ. Uh, they are special structures that help carry out the cell's functions. Uh, here we have an example of a prokaryotic cell. 
not much going on in there. This is an example of an animal cell. You can see there's a lot more things inside and a lot more action is taking place. So where do cells come from? Uh, if they come from a cell, where did the first cell come from? Um, more than likely, the first forms of life on this planet were prokaryotic. Uh, they were simple, and then they became eukaryotic later on. The plasma membrane, uh, which I call the PM, or abbreviated the PM, uh, is uh, a boundary of the outside of each cell. This helps maintain homeostasis inside the cell. It keeps that internal parts internal, and it keeps all the external stuff outside. Uh, the plasma membrane is very thin and flexible. It also has the ability to control things that are coming in the cell and control things that are leaving the cell. And we call that selective permeability. Uh, permeability is how things travel through a membrane or a border. Uh, and being selective, of course, is allowing certain things to come in and out. We talked about phospholipids in Chapter 6. Uh, it's a special kind of lipid in the plasma membrane. Um, the plasma membrane is made of two layers of this phospholipid. Uh, so we call it the phospholipid bilayer because, of course, bi means two. The phospholipid bilayer, uh, the molecule there is on your screen, it is made of a polar head, which is the phosphorus and oxygen portion, and a nonpolar tail, which is the hydrogen and the carbon portion. The head, where the phosphorus and oxygen are, we call hydrophilic. Uh, hydro, of course, meaning water, and philic, standing, uh, stemming from the Latin term meaning love. So hydrophilic things are water-loving. The tails of the phospholipid bilayer, the hydrogen and the carbon, they are hydrophobic, which means they are water-fearing. So this is what the plasma uh, membrane looks like with the two layers of, of the lipid there. So the plasma membrane, uh, if we're going to give a job to everybody in the cell, uh, a great job for the, uh, the plasma membrane would be the security guard because uh, he's the barrier that separates environments. He's the one who's in charge of coming in and coming out. Now in the plasma membrane, there are also other components that are in there. Uh, it's much like, the cell is much like a little factory, um, and everybody in the factory has a job. Uh, the receptor proteins transmit signals. They act like a receptionist in an office. They transfer calls. Anchor proteins, uh, these are on the uh, plasma membrane as well, and they help give the cell its shape. Some proteins are specialized to move really, really big stuff or move uh, a lot of things in or out of the cell. And we call those transport proteins because they're like a tunnel. Other stuff in the plasma membrane uh, that keeps it uh, nice and fluid and flexible is cholesterol. So this keeps the phospholipid bilayer from getting all sticky and all the components in there from getting sticky. We also have some carbohydrate chains in the cell. Um, they act kind of like a, a Morse code. They help cells identify signals when you're calling from cell to cell. And carbohydrates also help give shape to the cell itself. We call the plasma membrane and all of its stuff that's in there the receptor proteins, the anchor proteins, the transfer proteins, cholesterol, carbohydrate chains. All of that stuff is constantly moving around the plasma membrane. It's as if you were in a building and the doors and the windows and the floors and the ceilings would all constantly be shifting around you. And we call that the fluid mosaic model. Um, so all of those components are in constant motion. And that helps keep the plasma membrane nice and flexible. And it also helps control things going in and out of the cell. And this ends part one of chapter seven, cellular structure and function.